So we're ready to move on to our next section, uh, the other type of the uh, two kinds of methods. Uh, one is axis, which we just went over. The other, which we're starting now, is the linears. All right. So on our uh, Hiden Denkiden show, uh, we're going to be going over next uh, primal basics. Six, seven, and eight. All right, and they are the uh, fire plow, fire saw, fire thong, and uh, just a couple of reminders here. We're just going to go over real quick. Organizationally, at least for the fire dojo, uh, these names. You notice their spelling is a little different uh, from traditional writings that you'll see. Um, I have the prefix of fire, spelled my usual way, P-H-Y-R-E. And uh, I have this for two reasons mainly, again. One is uh, to keep it separate in this era of the search engine from Friction Fire, which will bring you everything in the world on Friction Fire uh, with an F. So at least if you were to uh, search for Friction Fire with P-H-Y, uh, you're going to find me a lot easier, right? The other thing too is, which I feel is more important, is that fire, for least in the fire dojo, spelled this way, P-H-Y-R-E, it specifically means uh, a life-supporting fire, specifically, okay? Not just any fire, not just a fire where, um, you know, can be set by arsonists or fireworks or any other kind of relative use or happening with fire. This kind of fire, spelled this way, at least for us, it is a life-supporting fire. Going back to how our ancestors had the specific need that if they didn't have fire, they were going to die, okay? To stay warm, to cook food, to purify water, uh, to make tools, things like that. So. The specific spelling is for those two reasons, right? And uh, I'm sorry if you, some people out there don't like it, but there's no universal regulation on on how to uh, name these things. I've kept the names uh, as close to what most people know them as on purpose to not confuse myself or anyone else, but this is how it is in, in the fire dodge. So, and uh, again, it's the Hiden Denki Den Show. Okay, uh, the uh, kind of training, uh, uh, hidden uh, trade secret, uh, written, uh, you know, uh, record or log, which is basically what this is, right? Comes from my martial arts background and uh, the Bujin Khan, and again from the Bujin Khan. Back in the day, if you can remember, I talked about the eight key home. And the eight key home for us were the eight basics. And they're made up of five grappling moves and three striking moves. And as a kind of appropriate coincidence, um, we just went over the five drills. And they're all like grappling moves. They're all twists and turns. And now we're going into the linears, which are like the three strikes uh, basics of our of our lineage and uh, they're all you know straight head on which is how these methods work so uh, uh, again I think it's an appropriate coincidence so I'm using that as a metaphor at least for those out there that know that and understand that and still with the Bujin Khan how we train in our martial arts and our combat training uh, we start off with what, what, what some people would call a kata. We call it a waza. And uh, it's like some kind of basic form. So we'll open up our scroll or book or training manual or something like that. And we'll pick out a technique that we'll start to work on. But we'll focus on that, kind of get that down. And then what we'll do is we'll start to break it apart and start changing things here and there. And start playing around with it. 
So again, we're going to go in the order of um, Promethei, which is an introduction, okay, our, our uh, kind of dedication to Prometheus and the, the four thoughts. Then we go into science of the basic form, which is we lay down the foundational technique, the basic form, and uh, how most people would know it and how they would first learn it. And again, this covers uh, the if only question, if you can remember that. If only uh, we can get this fire going, how would we do that with what we have? So. Uh, it goes over that question. And on the equation, we're going again from right to left. We're going to go from structure through the variables and get it to function. Okay, those three important things. We're going to go that way. And uh, just to uh, remind you that these are the scales. So like in music, if you're uh, a music aficionado, uh, these are the scales. And again, they are eight, which is really funny. So then we go into Art of the Variation, uh, which for us would be like uh, if you do Aikido or like it's a Rondori, where it's kind of like a free flow kind of whatever comes at you, you just kind of work on. All right. And we'll do like the what if question, which is what if we change this? What if we alter this? What if it's this wood? What if we do it this way? And you're just playing around with it. So, and if you're in a music aficionado, again, this is like jazz, where you're just kind of playing around with something and see how something sounds and make it sound real cool, right? And this is how you start to attain uh, the mastery by uh, really getting to know the ins and outs and doing it every possible which way you could start to think of. And on our equation, we'll be going from left to right. So we know what the function is. Let's play with the variables and create a whole new structure. Okay, so that's the way we'll go with that. All right. And then following that is the epimetheai or the afterthoughts. Now with the linears, all right, there is only a core two. All right, so there's... Um, with the drills, all right, with those five, we went up the scale of what would be more pieces, less effort, as you saw all the way up to the toggle drill, which we just did. But now we're kind of kind of going to be stuck on a plateau where we have, um, like the hand drill, less pieces, more effort. All right, so this is actually going to require a lot of energy. Although, unlike the hand drill, the hand drill can cause wounds. You know, it'll cause blisters, open wounds, um, things like that. It can wreck your hands. Now, just so you know, fire plow, fire saw, and fire thong should not do that to your hands. It really shouldn't uh, wreck your skin at all. And if it is, you're seriously doing something wrong because it, it really shouldn't. Like, not at all. You're going to use up quite a bit of energy. You'll tire out, but uh, your health should not be in jeopardy. Okay. Now, with these core two, uh, there's a slight change. Again, with the core two, there's a male counterpart and a female counterpart. Right? With the spindle, that's obviously the male. With the base, that's obviously the female. Well, with the linears, uh, the structure of the core two is a little different. So we are now, instead of calling uh, what we have a spindle, it's because it's not a spindle, uh, we're going to be using what's called a blade. So I'm going to be referring to the blade as the male counterpart, and the base will s still stay as a base, as a female counterpart. So we're going to have, instead of the spindle and the base, we're going to have the blade and the base. All right, just to clarify. We're still going to be speaking the first language of structure, variable, and function for an equation. So there's going to be a few changes to the 22 variables, okay, now that we're doing the linears. And uh, uh, since we no longer have spindles, we don't have an axis. So the axis 
is now the line. Okay, instead of it spinning as an axis, we're going to be moving in a straight line. All right, which I had mentioned way back earlier when I went over the 22 variables, and now it's the line. The other one is rotations, because uh, we don't have a spindle, is now changing to strokes, okay, because we don't have a spindle. We have a blade. Another thing you should probably pay attention to is that uh, the containment or the notches are going to be quite different. So you should really pay attention to them because different. So you should really pay attention to them because they're not really much like the uh, spindle notches. Okay. Uh, there'll be a bunch of other changes to the variables, but we'll go over those as needed. And again, we really need to stay within the mean. Okay, there's always going to be too much and there's always going to be too little and we have to stay right in the middle, which is the golden mean. All right, so um, especially fire plow next, which is uh, a real density hardness issue. There's a specific, very small golden mean that really works with the fire plow. Okay, so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, another thing you notice as we go over the, uh, the linears is uh, the sections are going to be shorter. Um, we only have a core two, so we only have so many pieces. So um, not only is it less pieces, more effort, it's less pieces, less variation. And because of the less pieces, less time spent on those methods. Not that we wouldn't spend more, it's just it's harder to when you only have two pieces to play around with. But still you're going to see things that you've never seen before. Can't promise that. Uh, the key to these methods, I feel, with the linears, okay, is going to be what I call a, a focused consistency in your technique. Okay, um, in a way you have to be very accurate uh, with keeping your line and staying focused on uh, on that notch um, and the variables of that notch and how the coal ember is going to form okay you almost have to truly feel in a sense uh, the coal ember dust forming when you're doing the technique so but um, again you'll with practice and training, you get that down for, for more mastery, okay? And uh, just as a reminder too, uh, these things that I came up with, even though they're my creations and my intellectual property, um, I say that the universal knowledge of friction fire is for all of humanity to share. No one person, nobody, no one uh, could ever just own uh, friction fire, anything about friction fire. So it really is to share. Uh, humanity wouldn't be around without it. All right. And uh, like any uh, new upgrade, just like any upgrade, remember that we'll change this, so we'll fix this, we'll make this better. Um, upgrades have complications. Well, new methods have their own complications. Okay, so be prepared for uh, uh, some challenges, which is uh, really what makes this worth doing. Okay. Uh, there's always a catch-22 factor. Uh, you change one thing, you're going to alter something else. So you'll have to kind of uh, fix that and uh, as you go along, okay, as you come across those things. So, preparation is everything for uh, mastery and success, but on the flip side of that coin, your fails are just as important as your successes and your, uh, you know, getting all those coals and blowing your tinder bone on the flame. Uh, as awesome as that is, you have to know what really doesn't work, okay, and why it doesn't work.
and be able to explain to other people why those things don't work. So that's really the mark of a, a really good and true teacher. Someone who could train you in not only why it works, but why it doesn't work. Okay. In fact, I would highly recommend that you read or even see, because it's somewhere I think it's on YouTube, is, uh, it, of course you know Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling gave a uh, address to a graduation ceremony at Harvard. And uh, so if you search engine that, you'll be able to find it. But you should read what she said. It's pretty amazing about failure. So, and since we all know who J.K. Rowling is and who Harry Potter is, you should probably pay attention to why she said failure was so important. All right. Now we're going to do a uh, fire plow next, then fire saw, then fire thong. The fire plow, okay, is a uh, push pull method. Okay, push pull. The fire saw is also going to be a push pull method. Okay, but the fire thong is going to be a lot like toggle drill. Okay. And it's going to be a pull-pull method. But we'll get to all that as, uh, as we get to it. All right. So here we go. We're going to go into fire plow now. And uh, have fun. Good luck. Welcome to the Promethei segment of Fire Plow. Okay. And uh, a Fire Plow uh, may not be for everyone. Okay. Uh, you have to have a little bit of uh, mass to be able to pull this off. So you may need to be like a, like a teenager, at least at that kind of age or something like that. Um, Again, it does require a lot of what I call focused consistency in order to be able to do this technique. But it can be done uh, if, if you train in it. And I think just, just about almost anybody could do it. Do I think a little kid can do it? Probably not. Um, you probably need quite extensive training to do something like that. And then it, it may not be worth it. But uh, The fire plow is, uh, is a great and wonderful technique. It's literally rubbing two sticks together, uh, just like fire saw. Okay, you know when uh, the, there's a real difference between a fire plow and fire saw, in that, for example, your base. Okay, you have your blade and your base. All right, now your blade goes uh, longitudinally. Okay. It goes in line with the base this way back and forth. Whereas the fire saw lays like a cross, okay, and goes across the base this way. All right. Now, when you were a little kid and you were trying to rub two sticks together, I'm sure you were doing them like this. And that's kind of like the fire saw. So, what we're going to do is we're going to line up the base with the blade, actually, the tip of the blade, and we're going to get a coal this way. All right. Now the fire plow uh, really comes from the region of our planet in the Pacific. Pacific Islands, um, it's been seen in Australia, I believe, but uh, probably the most famous people uh, that have made the fire plow known are in like the Samoans. And they're very famous for being able to do it, uh, some of them, one-handed. One guy literally, he holds the base in his hand and he has the blade in the other and he just goes like this and gets fire. So, they're well known for doing that. Now, uh, I think they use over there uh, a kind of variation or type of hibiscus, which is very soft. Now, what you need to know about fire plow is you need to use very 
low density woods. Uh, with their hardness has to be very low. Okay. And with that, uh, right off the bat, naturally, you're not going to find many woods like that. Okay, uh, unless you're unless they're all native to your area. Um, here in Jersey, most everything is a hardwood. So, uh, but the native hibiscus there, which seems to be uh, all over the Pacific area or something like that, uh, is very abundant. And the other thing you should realize too is with the fire plow, it's in a region where it's always warm. Okay, if you notice the drill methods come from areas. Uh, that are actually pretty cold, like parts of Europe, um, northern North America, you know, places where the temperatures get pretty low. So you can see the efficiency and the necess necessity of the technique and the method of the drills for those areas. However, with these core two methods, they come from regions that are warm of our planet and which seems to make sense because you only have two pieces and you have to be able to do that with getting by with just what you have all right seems to make sense though when you think about it this method was first shown to me by my friend Dan Stanfield we used to work together uh, at the school and uh, one day or one week I should say in the back room between teaching people uh, he showed us the the fire plow and I always I want to thank him now for that uh, because uh, it's uh, it, I'm, I'm just very appreciative of it because uh, it's added to my repertoire here and uh, I'm thankful to be able to pass it on and show it to other people so thanks to Dan Stanchfield uh, you get to see this method. Okay. Uh, again, we're, we have a blade and a base instead of a spindle and a base. And uh, so what's required of this core two is uh, you just have to be able to have the tools to be able to create uh, the blade and the base. And they're very actually easy to make once you get the idea. Uh, it's a lot less carving than the drill methods, except for maybe the hand drill, but a lot less carving. Um, all right, so to, to clarify, and uh, probably the movie that made Fireplow famous was Castaway, you know, with Tom Hanks. And um, if, uh, if you get a chance to see it again, or if you can recall clearly, he starts off doing the hand drill, which if you look, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing the film. I'm not doing that. I'm just um, pointing out um, some technical things, okay, just for clarification. As a teacher, I'm required to do that. So uh, don't get me wrong, good movie, you know, love Tom Hanks, all that stuff, not bashing the movie, um, but... Uh, uh, from what we're going to learn here, uh, it's, it'll go against the grain of what you saw in the movie, so, which I don't think can work. But he starts off doing hand drill. As you can see, his spindle for the hand drill is, is too thick. It has too much surface area. <clears throat> and he, uh, which of course, he gets less rotation. He can't get enough spin. And uh, the surface area where the base end of the spindle meets the base itself, um, all that is messed up. He has no notch. And basically what happens is he wrecks his hands, right? We know that from hand drill, you just wreck your hands. So he's uh, trying to shave off a piece of coconut, right, with his uh, stone, stone uh, tool, right? And he kind of comes up with the idea to do the fire plow. And 
So he's going and going and going, and then he breaks the stick and he hurts his hand and he gets all upset and he throws the base at a tree and he cracks the base. Okay. Then he calms down and he, he goes to do the technique again of the fire plow and it starts to smoke. Well, what he sees is that he, when he threw the base against the tree, he cracked the base and this crack causes air to be able to get to the friction to ignite it. Well, this is actually completely wrong. You would never use a base that was cracked because it's completely unstable. If you can see the base that he has, it's completely unstable. Plus, you don't need a crack in your base for the air to be able to get to a fire plow. Okay? It's surrounded by air, and it doesn't need a crack in it that's, that's notch-like uh, for not only the coal to, for the, for the place for the coal to go or form, but it doesn't need air to get in that way. Okay? So, if you're cracking your base for a fire plow, you're doing it all wrong. Okay? That, you're just going to destroy your base, okay? and it's going to be unstable. And you'll be doing your fire plow and you're going to break your base even farther. And it's not going to work and you're going to be all frustrated because of what you saw in the movie. Now why that's in there, they had to have someone uh, kind of show them how to do it. So I don't understand why it's that way. But there it is. Um, but then again, great movie of uh, a human's ability to survive and keep going. Uh, for the in the human spirit okay all right so with that um, we're gonna go right into science of the basic form do our variables okay do the basic technique and uh, then keep going all right let's go All right, so welcome to the size of the basic form segment of fire plow. And uh, first thing we need to do is get some material. Now I'm going to show you starting off with the material I first learned it on uh, when I uh, was taught by it from uh, Dan Stanfield, and that was sotal. Sotal is a uh, if you know yucca. We've worked with uh, yucca, right? Yucca stalks. You're probably familiar with these now, okay? Now imagine a giant yucca. And these are in the, uh, the southwest. Now I'm in New Jersey, so I am nowhere near sodal as a natural material. Um, these sodals I got from uh, someone at the school many, many years ago. And I still have a little bit of a supply left over. And uh, I took the skin off these already, so they look a little lighter than they're supposed to, all right? 
they've been uh, shaved down a little bit. But this is like the average size of like the base. And uh, these things can be like 12 feet tall, all right? Maybe more, uh, these soda stalks. Uh, this one particular base measures, uh, you can see, two inches across in diameter, all right? This one's even larger. All right, so the first thing we need to do is create a blade and a base. All right, now the blade, let's do the blade first. If you're familiar with uh, Japanese martial arts or Japanese culture, there's a knife called a, uh, a tanto in, uh, in Japanese martial arts and it kind of has that kind of look about it where it's uh, angular at the tip because it's an armor piercing point because uh, samurai used to wear uh, armor and the blades had to be thick and being able to penetrate so it kind of had that kind of design these are two knives I would use in, in training now the blades here. Okay. You can see. Um, notice they kind of have that same kind of angular tip. All right. And what's really important is the width of the blade. It has to be consistent where it meets the base. So my favorite measurement for the blades, all right, as a width, is a quarter of an inch. All right, so, and it should be consistent for at least uh, an inch and a half, maybe two inches down, okay? Because what's gonna happen is like a spindle, as you rub this thing, it starts to burn down, okay? Now, as it burns down, you don't want it to get into a thicker, thicker area, okay? See how this eventually gets thicker? You don't want that to happen. All right, so uh, make sure it goes down consistently for a quarter of an inch for a little bit, all right? And if it gets shorter, you're gonna have to cut it down a little farther, all right? So these handles are somewhat round, and the tip is specifically carved out to a quarter of an inch, all right, in width as a blade, and then it's somewhat angled. But we'll get to that. Okay. Now, uh, you can simply carve these out. If it is sodal, um, it's very, very soft wood. So stone tools should make uh, quick work of that. But uh, in the real world, I have a circular saw. So what I do is I'll take a section of sodal, something like this big, right? And, and I do this for economical reasons because I find there's a lot of waste of material if, uh, if I just randomly carve things out. So I, I really want to um, uh, save material and not waste, okay? And this is really why I do this. Um, primitively, uh, it'd be harder to find a way to do this, to split this down and uh, because it may run out. But in putting, stalk, okay, which is round, on a circular saw, and you can see that flattens out, right? I cut out sections of quarter inch um, blades, all right, that are consistent throughout. And then they look like this. So throughout the entire length of the blade, it's a quarter of an inch, okay, the whole thing, all right? And that saves all material, right? So that's just economic, and I think respectful, so that I'm not just you know using up material that has a whole bunch of waste around it and then tossing it after that. So, right? Just to keep that in mind. Now the base. Now what you'll see a lot of people doing 
when they're starting off learning this, is they'll basically just take the stalk and they'll lay it down and they'll try to secure that down and then they'll take their blade, all right, and they'll just start going at it. Now, the fire plow is one of the easiest methods you could do. It's almost like literally picking up one stick and rubbing it against another, all right? Uh, the carving of a notch isn't even really necessary. The starting of a groove might be, okay? But a notch may not necessarily be uh, needed, all right? And usually isn't, okay? But a lot of times you'll see people just laying a section of sodal base down. Some people will uh, wrap it up like this with like an old t-shirt or a towel or buckskin, something like that. And you have to secure it, okay? Because you really can't let this thing move. Now there's, there's a couple uh, thoughts on the technique of securing this while uh, with your body, I should say. Now one is, which I, I don't like, I, I really can't do it this way, is to do it as a side method, where you sit on it, like this on the ground, and we're on the table, so it's, it's not really on the ground. And this would actually be longer, these sections are actually longer. And you would take your fire plow, and you would go like this, while you hold on it, sitting on it like this. And you're basically bearing your weight on top of this while you're doing these strokes back and forth, okay? I really just, I can't do it like that. I, I don't like that method. And I would only do that as a last resort, but I can't ever even see that happening, all right? Another kind, which some people do, is to hold it between your kneeling legs, all right? And then work on it this way. And I would, I would much rather do it that way, okay, than the other method, all right? But um, my favorite method is really to just secure it to the ground in some way so that I don't have to worry about it. So for me, the variable of stability is really, really key with this. Um, I'll get my carvings down as best I can and then I'll really, really work on stabilizing the base so that I just don't have to worry about it, okay? Now here's what I'm not going to do, okay? I'm not going to um, put grooves in a perfectly good round piece of sole, all right? and waste all the wood that's around it, okay? So um, I have some extra sections that I have here that I'm going to use as bases, and you can see they're, they're already cut, all right? You could use these. And I'm not gonna waste these. So we're going to work on this, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to secure these. Here's a base that was used so you can get an idea, okay? And can you see here, there's a burn mark? That's where the coal was formed. So basically I'm here, and the blade is running this way along the groove, okay? and it's pushing coal dust forward. It can also pull it back. Sometimes you get two coals. You get one up here and one back here. But most of the time you're actually pushing forward. And all the dust collects at the tip. Now here's what I mean by precision. If you're not precise in this stroke, each and every time you'll destroy the coal that you are trying to create, okay? You basically just push through and destroy everything. You have to stop precisely at the same point each and every time so that the coal dust collects in a pile right there and you eventually push an ember into the pile and it ignites. 
That's how that works, okay? All right. So we're going to get this set up. And uh, we get a close-up with the camera and show you how it's done. All right. Now there's two handle sizes that I want to quickly go over. There's your large um, two-handed one, which you actually saw Tom Hanks do, where he had one in the back, one in the front, and he did it like this. Okay. The other way is to have a short one, which is really the one I prefer. And what you do is you put your thumbs behind it and then you lace your fingers around it. Okay. And the back end sticks up so that this is a rest so it has nowhere to go. And then you with your fingers laced go back and forth that way this way I have a lot I feel I have a lot more control and can add a lot of pressure but the most important thing is I can get a lot of speed now with me and this is specifically me um, I don't think I can get enough speed when I'm doing it this way okay so I usually tend to use the smaller one more often but uh, in this attempt, I'm going to do it the, uh, the wide two-handed method just to kind of get it going to show you, okay? Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is starting off the groove, okay? Now, here's our sotal. I cut it in half. All right. Now, here it's... It's perfectly plain, has nothing on it, okay? Now what we need to do, all right, is I have a C-clamp here on the table, and this is like a root or the base of a tree or a stone in the ground, something that you can push against, okay? And the end won't go anywhere, all right? And what I'll do a lot of times is I'll just put my knee here, on one end, okay, instead. So, what I'm going to do here, all right, let's flip this around, and I have something to protect my knee, okay, as I lay that on there. All right. Now, there's no groove here, so what you do is you take the tip that you've carved, okay, again, it's a quarter inch thick. And it has um, one side is longer than the other, as you can see. I take this, the actual point, I lay it this way. Okay, not this way, but actually this way. And with an edge, I start a groove. And the only thing I'm trying to do is create a place for the blade to fit in. I need a space for that blade to go. Now, there's two ways to do this. One is, if the wood will allow, it'll make a groove. But a lot of times, that won't happen. So you can either take um, something harder, okay, to create that groove in the softer wood, okay. Or, which is what happens when it's round, or you could take your knife and start kind of slicing out or carving out a groove. The problem with doing it this way, though, is you get a lot of fray. Okay? And it doesn't have to be too long. Now, I would probably say the length of your strokes are probably going to be no more than about eight inches. Okay? And that's really not a lot. Eight inches is probably pretty big. Your actual strokes are probably going to end up being around six, seven maybe. Okay? So just kind of as a measurement, you may just want to 
um, go from like thumb to little finger as a measurement as to where you're going to go. Okay. This is a mark. And then get your groove. Either with a stone or a knife or just through pressure with your blade. And again, this is really one of the easier methods to actually create from start to finish. Okay. Now, then you have to kind of made it together. Just like with the drill, the spindle and the base, you have to mate the blade and the base together. See, now we have a groove where it doesn't just slip. And you saw that before, right? That was important to see. But here, we're not really getting that now. I mean, it may still happen. See? but it's a lot less. Now we have to make sure that the length, the entire length of the groove is mated. Otherwise, while you're actually trying to perform the method, it's gonna keep popping out. Right. I'm actually getting smoke. that in, kind of angle it to the side a little bit, to open it up, open the groove up, angle it this way, angle it this way, okay, and I think I'm ready to give it a shot, so let me just get situated here. fix my blade a little bit since it wore out a little bit. Okay. Again you want a warm up period. Just get it warmed up. Take it nice and easy. Don't freak out. Okay? You can even actually start to smell it burn, which it is now. Here's the mess I have, okay? Let me take the camera down, and I'll show you. I'll hold it to the side. Now you can see that there is coal dust to the sides all over the place, but nothing collected really in the front much, a little bit. Some in the back, some in the front, 
I'm really off to the sides. I've lost quite a bit. There's even stuff just hanging out on the sides here. If you notice. See that? Got pushed off to the side instead of actually going to the front and collecting. This is important to see. Now I told you I don't like this, the two-handed method, doing it that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change gears and do the short uh, blade method. Okay, here we go. Now the other thing you're going to want to do um, with your blades is uh, protect your hands. Now the way this one's carved, it's kind of rectangular, right? So these edges, even though it's round, some parts, okay, it can hurt your hand because you're basically pressing your hands, your fingers, and the bones of your hands down onto pieces of wood. Okay, so you may want to uh, wrap, okay, your blade up inside a piece of cloth, like a piece of towel, t-shirt, something like that, that's going to protect your hands, okay? Something like that. And then again what I do, the thumbs go underneath, fingers get laced, and I'm able to apply all my pressure okay so let's see if you can see here back my chair up. this is the same groove now here what what I've done is because I'm doing this on the table all right I have the back side clamped now if I I could do the push stroke and the clamp it won't go anywhere but when I do when I pull back this thing will go flying with me now in the variables, the list of variables, the 22 variables, um, when we discuss pressure, uh, like with the drills, like the bow drill, that is a unilateral force when we apply that, um, I'm sorry, when we do back and forth reciprocation as a variable, not pressure, there's a unilateral force or a bilateral force. Well, this is a unilateral force. So it's going this way and then this way, all right? So the base is gonna go that way and then this way. So here we have to prevent that. So I've stabilized it here. Otherwise, normally I would be kneeling on it, okay? If I had a longer base. So again, we need focus consistency and a bit of precision. I'm gonna get this warmed up. You'll notice that my strokes will be a little faster. And I can actually apply a whole lot more pressure. And there's our coal. Let me take this off. So now, as you can see, most of the dust, uh, not as much on the side. There's a little bit in the back, but most of it got pushed forward. And then what happened was a coal ember got pushed into the pile. And lit up that pile of dust. And that is basically the basic form. So let's shoot it from another angle, okay? Just so you can get a better idea. Just so you can see what I've done, okay? Here's our base. Now what I've done here is I've created a new groove lower, okay? As you can see here, here's the, the burn mark of the uh, where the coal was, okay? Um, so I'm basically going to go up this way 
and put the new coal here at the base of this one. Okay? So let's secure this down from this point of view. Okay. There's our quick lamp. I'm gonna wrap my blade up. Now when I start off, I like to use the short part of the blade down here. Not the long one, the short. Okay. Because what happens is as as this burns down, it looks like this. Okay. So we start off with the short part. So first we have to mate our groove, we have to mate the blade to the base. Okay. A little bit to the side, a little bit to the side, open it up a little bit. Okay. I can see some smoke starting. As you get it warmed up, it starts to smoke. And then when it starts to get brown, that's when you start using that focus consistency. I'm getting a really good dust pile. And we have a coal array. Okay. It's one of the fastest too, you'll notice. So we're going to zero in on that. next. The perspective we're going to do next is a real close-up from the side. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so here I've started another new groove with my knife. Okay, you can see it's white. Here's our two burn marks from the coals. So we went up this way, there's our first coal. We went up this way, here's our second coal. Okay, now we're going to do a third, and we're going to do it from a close-up side point of view, so that it looks like this. Okay, so let me put that in there, and then I'll adjust the camera. Secure that in. Let's get the point of view that we want. So my blade is getting shorter. Uh, let me just recarve the tip here. Down a little bit. Again, we have to mate the blade to the base. Let me adjust my towel here. Just press it on my fingers. A little bit to the side. A little bit, a little bit to the side. Open up the groove a little bit. Right to the left, to the right, to the left. Start getting it mated. Now it starts to turn brown. That's a key that it's warmed up. So I'm just going to go to town now. Just keep pushing those embers forward. And there.
there's our coal. Then I'll blow on it for you. Turn it on its side so you can see. And there's our third one in a row. Quick and easy. So a lot of key points in there, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the variables now, okay? Here we go. All right, so we just did three coals in a row, very easily, okay? Again, I, I don't like this two-handed method. For me, it's just too slow. I just can't seem to get the coordination well doing it this way. I just can't get it uh, fast enough, but you may. You may like this. Uh, this technique may be better suited for you than um, than the one that I did. So, but the only way I can demonstrate a success for you actually is, is with this one. Really, I'm sure if my life depended on it, I could get this going. But we're not doing that today. My life doesn't depend on it. <laughs> so, um, health. Um, not as big a deal as hand drill. Hand drill will definitely ruin your hands. But still, um, you're not going to like the pressure points that are placed on your hands uh, when you're, when you're um, stroking the blade back and forth on the base. So I really recommend you wrapping the blade in something, okay, to protect your hands anyway. Because it's just painful. It doesn't feel good. I mean, it won't ruin your hands, but it's, it's, makes it, for very, it makes it very uncomfortable and you will want to bear down less pressure because the more pressure you bear, the more the, the pressure points are gonna hurt your hands. So protect your hands and then you can bear down all the pressure you want. Just be careful not to break your blade. Okay, because something like this can be a little fragile because it's a very low density wood. Soda is low density, okay. Uh, same with the base. If you're gonna kneel on it or have your hip on it, I really am very uncomfortable with having my hip on it. Uh, in fact, it kind of hurts. So I don't like that method. I would definitely rather kneel on it in some form, which you saw earlier, okay? Um, but always protect your body, protect yourself, okay? And uh, when using your tools, your stone tools, your knives, again, be careful, okay? Don't cut yourself. Uh, energy. So, yes, um, Less pieces, more energy. But what you'll find is with this focus consistency is it really is just a quick sprint when you're doing it. And it goes pretty fast. Um, once you kind of get the feel for how it gets done, um, you don't get winded that fast anymore because, uh, yeah, you're sprinting, but it's so short that it really doesn't bother you too much. Um, the only problem would be is if you don't get it, uh, like hand drill, the problem would be is if you don't get it, you have to keep trying. And then you'll get exhausted, more exhausted, more exhausted after each and every try. So again, it's, it's more important to have the training and the practice so you just get it the first time. And not out of ego. Don't get it the first time out of ego. Get it the first time out of survival. Because each attempt will drain your energy. And make each attempt uh, possibly less su successful. Okay. Uh, need. Need kind of in this case not only just comes from needing um, a life supporting fire. But you're going to need to figure out how uh, to do it with uh, the materials you only have at hand. Okay. Uh, skill and confidence. Again, this, this does need some practice. It looks easy, 
kind of like the story of the, the locksmith. Uh, one guy locked his keys uh, out of his car. And uh, so he had to call a locksmith. Locksmith came and uh, jimmied the door and, you know, opened it right up. And then the guy wouldn't pay. He goes, I'm not going to pay you. I mean, you took three seconds to open up that door. So what the locksmith decided to do was he, uh, instead of just, you know, uh, doing it really quickly, he would make it look like he's, you know, working at it, like he really had to try, things like that, and then the guy would pay him <laughs> after, so that somebody, so that someone would pay him after that, so it's a funny thing. So, but you definitely need uh, practice and training to kind of make it happen as easily as you see it happen, okay? Uh, reason. Again, you're going to have uh, some complications with this to begin with. Figuring out the groove, the mating process, when to actually start burning, how to um, position your body just right to enable speed and pressure at the same time, okay, with these strokes. Uh, it takes a little bit of figuring out, uh, figuring out any the new complications for you that are going to arise of how to balance within the mean all of these variables. Okay. Means and resources, your materials must, must, must definitely be low density. Okay. The soil is low density. We're going to go over a few more that are low density. All right. And uh, you'll need something sharp to do your groove, carve out your base, uh, carve out your, um, your blade. All right. Chemical chemicals should not really be an issue. All right. Uh, the materials that you find, the low density woods, uh, they're not usually resinous or anything like that. So, uh, but again, keep it in mind. You never know. It could be a, a, a variable that you're missing. <clears throat> Moisture, humidity. Again, this method comes from an area of the Pacific where it is warm and humid, but as long as the material is dry, um, it should be fine, okay? Density hardness, again, the key thing is that it is a, a low density wood, very low density. Fuel, now, uh, a key thing with creating the coal ember here, the coal dust, is your energy. Now, once you get a coal, you may be running out of energy and uh, unlike the, the drill method, you can keep going and make more dust and make more coal extender to lengthen the life of that coal ember. But uh, in this case, you may run out of energy faster and may want to stop after you get a coal. So you may have less coal, ex coal extender dust that you would make. So you would have less fuel in that sense. So make sure you have plenty of... Uh, 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 either coal extender on the side or a very, very well-made tinder bundle that's going to ignite very quickly with, with the small coal that you have. Containment in the notch? Well, there really isn't, is there? Um, you try your best to keep the dust from flying over the sides by having an excellent groove and by your precision which pushes the dust to a specific place without you destroying it by you overshooting that. Okay, very important. That place is very important. Air, air isn't really necessary with this large open space. <clears throat> and again, I, I had to talk about um, the point of uh, Castaway where Tom Hanks said, well, he had a crack in his base and he says the air got to it. Well, that, that really isn't necessary. Pressure, you have to have a consistent pressure with the speed. Speed and pressure are gonna be really key in this method. And uh, to raise that temperature, get the right kind of abrasion pressure, right, that we talked about in the past. Uh, raising the temperature. Uh, so a balance of speed and pressure is really going to raise that temperature, is what's really going to make it work. All right. Back and forth reciprocation. 
again, uh, we have to stabilize the base because of the unilateral force, all right? If this thing kicks out at any point in time, you've destroyed your whole effort. All right, so that'll be key. Now, your, your back and forth motion has to have uh, precision. You have to start and stop in the same place all the time to get that coal to push forward without overshooting. So your back and forth reciprocation has to have precision. Your line has to be perfectly straight. So your the groove that you start with should be very, very straight. Should have no wobbles in it, should not kick to it. If you have anything that's kind of a wave in it or snake-like curve, coal dust is gonna go flying off the side and it won't go into the little pile that you're trying to make, okay? So at least keep your line straight for that reason that you're not just fl flying fuel all over the place. It's not gonna collect, okay? Strokes, um, keep your strokes accurate. Have a focused consistency until you're done, okay? And keep practicing. <laughs> Duration and time. You kind of get a feel for when enough has been enough. I mean, you'll see your dust pile actually start smoking right in front of you. It's, it's, it's such an excellent thing to see. I never get tired of, of seeing it, okay? But you can, like, count the seconds of going, but the thing about duration and time, too, is, it's again, it's not a race. You have to allow for the mating process, allow for the warm-up, process and then the actual um, trying to get a coal, all right, the actual friction. Speed, they, again, I have a personal difficulty with the two-handed, uh, separated two-handed method, okay, I like the interwoven finger method. This gets me speed a lot faster, I think. I think the fact that one shoulder for me behind the other and trying to almost do it with my whole upper body kind of slows things down. So the fact that I have my shoulders uh, square and aligned and I just use my arms while just resting my body weight on it, I think I, I just, I go much faster. It's a much more comfortable technique for me to do it that way. So I get more speed that way. It may be different for you, but however you get it, you have to get it. Okay, the speed is necessary. Not enough speed, you're not gonna be able to raise that temperature, okay? Space, you're gonna need plenty of space to get this done. Okay, so a lot of, your arms are flying everywhere, all right? So make sure there's nothing around that's gonna be in your way, all right? Surface area, again, your blade width is very key, I like a quarter of an inch. Start with that, and then, after you have a, a lot of successes, a little bit more, a little bit less, okay, you can practice with. But start off with a quarter inch, okay? Take my word on that for your surface area. The other thing, too, about the surface area of your base, um, it doesn't have to be round like this, okay? In fact, that kind of makes it harder, doesn't it? instead of having a flat surface. Flat surface is much more easier to do this on than a round surface, which keeps kicking off to the side, right? So keep that in mind. And again, what you really need, which we're gonna go over, is you only need, uh, at, the, at, at the minimum, half an inch of wood to maintain this groove. Okay, think about that for a minute. The most you need is half an inch to maintain, to have enough wood on each side of that groove, which is a quarter of an inch. But we'll go over that in a second. And stability, finally, very, very key. That unilateral force is, if you don't have your base stable, it's going to destroy everything, okay? However you get it situated, with your hip, 
kneeling on it or staking it down. So the other thing you can do, like you did with the, the drill bases, is pin your base and then have one in the front and one in the back. Because you have your unilateral force, you don't want this to go anywhere this way. Okay, so pin that, and then to keep it from kicking to the side, pin an X and an X. Make sure these are not too long, that they're in your way. Okay, this violates your, your space. Okay, keep them really short so that this is not in your way. All right. And finally, we, uh, we go over our pad pie, our problem, right? So we're going from uh, right to left. So structure, variables, function, right? So we're doing the basic form. We're learning how this happens, all right? So uh, we have our problem, we need a fire, okay? How do we do it with this core two, these core two pieces, a blade and a base, all right? So we assess, we have to look at our pieces and figure out how we're going to put them together, okay? We diagnose, um, by uh, getting our assessments together, we figure out the method that we can uh, create a fire with, okay? We have a plan. We uh, decide how we're going to carve everything, how we're going to stabilize it, what um, method we're going to use, whether it's two-handed or interwoven fingers. You see, we have to decide all that, okay? And uh, then you have to actually do the method, okay? And then you evaluate how you did, all right? And if it achieved function. And if you did not achieve function, you have to go back to the variables and figure out which one is not within the mean, which has to be balanced in order to get function. So you have to go structure, variable, function, and get yourself fresh and fire, okay? All right, so from this point on, we're gonna call that uh, science of the basic form. It really doesn't get, uh, you know, much of a foundation more than that, okay? I mean, that's, that's really the basic. And uh, so from this point on, we're going to go into Art of the Variation and uh, play around with a few things. Okay, here we go.